Welcome to lecture part four of Ecosystem Diversity and Change. Um, we're going to discuss today how the rate of speciation, uh, in other words, the creation of new species, um, and the rate of extinction of species as the balance has been um, off kilter because of human activities and the fact that we are destroying and degrading habitats. This will, in the end, affect birth, Earth's biodiversity. Uh, so new species, speciation occurs, that's the, the word that we give for the formation of a new species from one origin. For sexually reproducing members of a population, a new species is formed when some members of a population have evolved to the point that they can no longer breed to produce fertile offspring. So in other words, you know a new species has formed. At one point, they all were able to interbreed, but because of some kind of isolation, which we'll talk about in a minute, these two species are have evolved differently and separately. So once you bring them back together again and they mate, they might be able to mate, anatomically speaking, but if they have an offspring, it is not um, going to be fertile. They will not be able to have viable offspring themselves. Um, so that's how we know spe the new species has ar arisen. Um, so since the dawn of time, we have been going through some um, artificial selection, which is basically where you have breeders who are, they, there's a desired trait, let's say there's Betty the cow produces more milk, therefore the farmer's going to make sure they breed the next milk cow, Betty's going to produce more of the calves. So people have been artificially breeding for a while, but some funny examples here um, of crossbreeding, so in other words, you're taking two different species um, just to try to get the tra desired traits. Um, see that is artificial selection these are some funny ones so I'm gonna take you down to my favorite Ooh, there's a waffen that was kind of funny but that one actually happens in nature sometimes it happens in nature without human intervention but then sometimes humans have to intervene simply and because of artificial insemination because of anatomy it's not gonna work out in their favor they did a camera because they're trying to get the temperament uh, changed they wanted the cooperative temperament of the llama here's a hybrid pheasant but hold on get to my favorite the Zorse. Okay, this one's awesome. This is an offspring of a zebra stallion and a horse mare. And guess what? It is infertile. That's the key to all of them. Um, okay, so anyway, these are funny. Of course, we've all heard of a liger. Okay, so how do we get the new species? Well, I kind of mentioned it earlier. Um, there has to be some kind of separation or isolation between a, a current species. Um, and the most common is called allopatric speciation. Basically here, there is something in the geography that prevents um, the, what was once an original one population from intermixing or intermingling anymore. And this could be because of natural occurrences such as a volcano, uh, let's say there's a new island chain that forms from the cooling of magma from the lava. Um, or let's say a river was rerouted because of uplift, maybe an earthquake, whatnot. And then of course there's always some human interference and examples of these are when you, um, you know, cut through a forest to put a highway or when you build a city and that affects the birds migratory patterns and migratory path. Um, so when that happens, animals that were previously, or I shouldn't say animals, organisms that were previously members of the same population get split. And so let's say there was a change in, a, basically a mutation, so a change in the genetic code of, an or, of one species. And okay, because we already said in order for there to be evolution, one spe there has to be mutation, then the individual has to be selected for, and then that has to be favorable, so therefore eventually the entire population will evolve as well. So if that happens to a species in one area, and the old species, that did not happen over there, or it might, but in a different way. So there could be a completely different... Um, change mutation going on in a separate population but over long periods of time then you bring those two species back together again remember they originated as the same species you bring them back together again and now they can no longer reproduce and have viable offspring um, so their offspring are infertile so here's an example of reproductive isolation. So usually what happens is, first of all, um, your, the geography is interfered with and then after that they can no longer mate and have fertile offspring Example are Arctic fox and gray fox. They had a common ancestor, and um, obviously there's a camouflage. Um, when you have white fur, it allows you to camouflage with the snow better, so that made it more favorable up in the Arctic fox to have a white coat. Gray fox adapted to heat through lightweight fur, long ears. By the way, the ear size uh, it helps with, it's an adaptation that helps with uh, heat and temperature, maintaining body temperature. Okay, so sympatric speciation is another way that species evolve. 
Um, and this one here, they don't get geographically isolated, so they're still living in the same habitat. Um, they become reproductively isolated still, though, and usually this is because of a chromosomal abnormality. Now, this wouldn't happen with humans because um, we need to ha stay, we really need to have 46 chromosomes. But um, remember, diploid versus haploid, our somatic cells are diploid, which means we'll have 46 chromosomes, but our sex cells are haploid, which means we have 23 chromosomes. When a uh, man and woman mate, then your um, zygote will have 46 chromosomes, and ours have to remain that way. But there are some organisms who have something called polyploidy, which means you have multiple um, chromosomes. And this is, happens pretty commonly in a lot of your plant species. And basically what happens is that once an organism has mutated to have this chromosomal abnormality, or in other words, goes from uh, haploid to diploid to now polyploid, the polyploid chromosomes can no longer mate with one that is diploid. Um, it just will not be viable. In other words, it will not live. Um, so that's how you get sympatric speciation. And then also it changes through ch uh, changes in breeding habits, also called parapatric speciation. Um, pretty much the way to think about that is that when, let's say, you used to mate, an organism used to m spawn and mate in the spring, and now for whatever reason, maybe there was a temperature change or um, maybe the, ha the conditions changed so that there was a drought instead uh, of having flood time. Something changed in the environment, and so they have uh, temporal speciation. In other words, they have different timing on when they reproduce. And so now, if you know, someone wants to mate in spring and someone wants to mate in um, fall, then they ain't getting together. Uh, so this slide is basically supposed to show you about genetic drift. And genetic drift is basically a change in the genetic composition of a population over time. And what's key to remember about this is that it's totally random. Just like the mutation in DNA happens randomly, it's just by chance, so is genetic drift. Basically, it's just kind of a shift in the allele frequency that you'll see in a population. And with genetic drift, um, the purpose of this animation is to show the difference in genetic drift if you have 25 flies versus 500 flies. If you have 25 flies, then you are going to have a greater chance of losing allele and changing allele frequencies, whereas the larger your sample size or the larger your population, um, the less likely you will lose um, certain alleles in a population. So for genetic drift to happen, usually it's a small sample size and um, it's not selected for in the environment. The environment is not selecting for a particular trait. It just happens to be that totally random and let's say if you have a population of um, I don't know white haired and black haired uh, rats we're just making that up um, and for whatever reason the white rats were not able to mate um, and the black rats were then you're gonna lose the white allele in that population and again that happens because it's a small sample size so if it's 25 flies versus 500 flies that's when you'll see that occur um, so extinction is forever speciation increases biodiversity so we do have a normal background rate of um, extinction it happens normally but we also have a normal speciation rate as well so where the hope is is that as we have extinction occurring that speciation is also occurring at the same time uh, what's been problematic and what they've noticed um, lately though is that the um, Extinctions are increasing and our speciations are decreasing. So usually the average lifespan of a species is like a million to 10 million years. Um, but 99% of the species that ever lived on Earth are actually extinct. And the major contributor is what scientists are saying. The major contributor to that um, is the, the environment shift. Um, and polar bears are a good example how they need um, the sheet of ice for hunting and they lose that sheet of ice three weeks earlier than it used to 20 years ago so now they're not going to have as much time to hunt and therefore their average of 67 kilograms uh, lower in weight and that is making them become um, sickly and not withstanding environmental changes as, as good um, so let's see, there's about one to five million each year extinction, um, but every once in a while we'll have something we call a mass extinction, and that's where um, extinctions occur m significantly above the natural rate. There's been about five. Um, the greatest mass extinction took place 251 million years ago, and about 90% of the marine species and 70% of land vertebrates went extinct then. But of course, the most well-known extinction, mass extinction, occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period, which was 65 million years ago. And guess what we lost then? 
yes, you're right, the dinosaurs. That's when the dinosaurs went extinct, and that's the one they think that was what happened there was there was a crater um, or an, a meteorite struck, and there's a crater-shaped bowl formation um, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And the reason they could tell that is that they have mapped out the different um, types of soil. And you can find that there's going to be a little bit more iron and magnesium in what would normally be um, a different type of rock structure. And that's what you find more in um, space rock or meteorites. Um, and so they think by that, what happened is that there was a huge dust cloud and that dust cloud uh, decreased the temperature because there was less photosynthesis and um, less solar radiation entering the planet. Um, blocked the, the much needed solar radiation there. Um, so really what's going on here now though, um, we said there was human impact. Um, we are in the middle of what most scientists say. We are beginning anyway, I shouldn't say middle. We are beginning our sixth mass extinction. Um, we are currently experiencing this because the extinction rate has actually been going from 2% up to like 25% going extinct. And that's a huge significant difference, especially if you consider the amount of um, medicinal plants that are out there we haven't tapped into yet, the um, enzymes, we've already talked about the secretions that come from amphibian skin that help with um, a lot of our uh, mes medicine. So there's a lot of medicinal reasons that we want to sustain our biodiversity and keep it the way it is. And we're going to talk a lot more about biodiversity later uh, in the spring. But the number one, the overlying cause for um, e extinction is simply uh, habitat destruction. That's the number one cause. But we also over harvest, we introduce invasives, um, we are contributing to global climate change, and then there's also emerging diseases. So we'll, we'll examine those more later on, but um, it's just important that we are thinking about that now and ways to recover our biodiversity. Um, and then extinction is forever. Once a species goes extinct, then um, you know, we're done. An endemic species, it's found only in one place, and these are particularly vulnerable. Um, a lot of our, we have something called hot spots. There are several hot spots around the world, and those are the ones that um, basically have high rates of endemic species. They're like your tropical rainforest, for example. Um, we have several tropical rainforests. Hawaii, the Hawaiian island chains, that's a home to many endemic species. A lot of your island chains will be home to endemic species as well. Um, so basically what they do is they try to conserve um, those hot spots of places with lots of endemic species. Um, and then they kind of have what we call umbrella policies. So what they'll basically do is they'll protect one maybe keystone species. And by doing that, um, there are other several other species that kind of trickle in um, that will be protected as a result of protecting that um, major species. So anyway, just things to think about. Extinction is forever. Um, and you want to do things to try to not... Um, play into the extinction factor. Woo, the end. Woohoo!